Good morning. Uh, my name is Ellie. <laughs> my name is Ellie Lushinsky. I've been a librarian for 35 years and a skeptic for about 30 years. Um, so just to let you know, I'm going not going to actually talk about my own library because I'm not here representing them. Uh, but Neil Gaiman says. Google can bring you back 100,000 answers. A librarian can bring you back the right one. Uh, and I'm sure we all know who Neil Gaiman is. I, no? Yes, yes. Um, people can see from this that libraries are important. They are information in the information age. This talk is going to be a little fast and loose, like librarians. Um, <laughs> What? Um, freedom of information is freedom. Accurate information is critical thinking. The question arises, why is false information counted as nonfiction? And how is information organized? Where do you find the good stuff? John Ashcroft, uh, do we all know who he was, the Attorney General? Um, under George Jr. Um, he was he went on the Today Show and was very concerned that librarians were more concerned with supporting porn than they were with preventing um, terrorism and indeed an unidentified FBI official wrote an email in 2005 that partially read while radical militant librarians kick us around True terrorists from the Office of Intelligence Policy and Review's failure to let us use the tools given to us uh, read the email in part. So you can see we are very scary and important people. The free and anonymous access to information is the key to freedom. And it's also key to the fight against Wu. Speaking of fights, um, just last week, uh, there was an incident in an unnamed library in an unnamed city who the, the librarian was standing at a bus stop, saw a person with library books removing the library labels, took pictures of him, grabbed the book, and yelled, explain to all these people why you are stealing from them. Do not mess with librarians. <laughs> What does this have to do with skeptics? Critical thinking needs accurate information. I found my own skepticism at the library, reading Mark Gardner, James Randi, and Carl Sagan. We are the guides to giving good information versus bad. We know who wrote the books. And when he asked for accurate information, I do not give them Sylvia Brown. We know who made the videos and I do not recommend Dylan Avery. We know the publishers, and we know our citations. Why am I talking about this? Well, a couple of years ago on the JF forums where I hang out, somebody was bragging very proudly that they had taken all the Bibles in their local library and filed them in the fiction section. Don't do that you will deal with the wrath of the librarian. So what does nonfiction mean, and why is the Bible counted as nonfiction? Well, in the library world, nonfiction does not necessarily mean true. Like any other classification system, it's a taxonomy. You have animals, you have plant life, you have fiction, you have nonfiction. So, we know that the origin of the species, I think we all agree, that is nonfiction, correct? <laughs> but the Bible is also in my department, which is a nonfiction department. Why is it there? Well, we also have poetry and folklore and some short stories. Um, and that's pretty much what the Bible is. Where are people going to look for it? They're going to look for it in the religion section, which is, oddly enough, where I work. Why do people read the Bible? How many people here have actually read all or part of the Bible? 
skeptics read the Bible. And so also I want to add that graphic novels are on in my department, which is a nonfiction department. Superman, as we all know, is not real. Please don't, <laughs> please don't tell my brother. When they had the, um, at the turn of the century, when they had the whole thing of the most influential person of the 20th century, he was very miffed that it was Oprah and not Superman. I was a little miffed too. This got classified as a preparatory manual. The Library of Congress, and my theory is they all kind of drink there, um, <laughs> made a mistake. And somebody looked at it and said, preppy handbook. Oh, it's a handbook to going to preparatory school. But that's, as we all know, it was a, um, it was a parody. So it is shelved neatly with all the other manuals for preparatory schools. How would you call Emily Dickinson? Fiction, nonfiction, just plain weird? And I really don't know what to do with this one. Uh, we all know about James Fry, who wrote his autobiography, went on Oprah, and then it turned, it was the book of the year for Oprah, and then, as it turned out, it was mostly lies. But it is still classed as nonfiction. There's an interesting story about In Cold Blood, uh, the Truman Capote book published in the 1950s about the murders in Kansas. The Library of Congress didn't know what to do with it. Uh, up until then, most of murder stories were written as case studies. This was written in a novelistic form. So they classified it as fiction, even though it was very well researched and true. So, but later on, they thought better of it, and it is now in the true life crime section, the, the section that Truman Capote actually invented. Who is this guy? That is not Melville Dewey, but he should be as famous as Melville Dewey. This is Charles Amy Cutter. Mr. Cutter invented the Cutter number, which I'll talk about in a minute. The classification system is like a language. This is the Library of Congress call number for a book written by a very interesting woman you may or may not know. ML means music about literature. Uh, literature about music, excuse me. Uh, there's some music about literature, I'm sure. Um, the ML is accidental. It is um, not music literature. It is simply that call number. M is scores, ML is literature, music literature, and MT uh, is music study and teaching. 128 in this classification is bibliography. S, three songs. L665 is my cutter number. Everything after the period is the cutter number. S, uh, L665 is my cutter number. I have my own cutter number. And 1998 is the publication. Um, the, the whole thing about the initials not, or the letters at the beginning of the number not being a mnemonic can get us into trouble because Bible study is classified as BS. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson in a um, letter to James Madison commented that we need to educate and inform the whole mass of people. They are the only sure reliance for the preservation of our liberty. So from Thomas Jefferson to Neil Gaiman, I think we can all agree that this is an important subject. Where is the good information? And uh, I am not as anti-Wikipedia as I used to be, I, I'm not a fan of open source information because anybody can put in anything. I know there's oversight, and Wikipedia is actually better than it used to be, and especially now that I'm part of Tim Farley's group and have editor status and all of that. But you have to be careful of websites. You need to know where they come from. You need to know who's posting. Otherwise, you can get into real trouble with information. I could put up a site about nuclear physics tomorrow um, and have people believe me. I have never even taken a physics course, although I had a nuclear physicist for a brother. 
Have you, has everybody seen that commercial? You can't put it on the internet if it's not true. There's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a commercial for, for some insurance company and the woman keeps saying, well, it can't be on the internet if it's not true. I'm dating a French model. <laughs> so, the weapons against Wu. Cite your sources. Make sure your sources are reliable. And if the facts lead you where you don't want to go, follow anyway. It might be more fun. Any questions? Any wild applause? <laughs> yes? Can you talk some about why books, some books get classified in fiction and nonfiction? Um, I th I'm sorry, I thought I did. It's, it's mostly uh, a taxonomy. Um, if the book is written with the intent of being fiction, uh, which is usually in, quite clear, not always, such as in the case of James Fry. But um, generally speaking, if the intent is fictional, it gets classified as fiction. Yes? Do you think that these two categories are a good system, or would you say that it might be better to have, like, maybe not necessarily black and white fiction, non-fiction? Well, it's not as black and white as it looks. Um, once you get into it, and that's what I try, tried to show with the poetry, which is neither fish nor fowl, um, so to speak. Um, the, it's a matter of learning the language, the, the language of the classification system, wh whether it be um, Dewey or Library of Congress or any of the more arcane ones. Yes, sir. Are all graphic novels filed under nonfiction? That seems strange because some in, graphic novels are fiction. Yes. In our library, they are all filed as nonfiction, which I argued against to begin with very strongly. And then it turned out it increased the circulation in my department dramatically, so I stopped arguing. <laughs> Do you think that it might be more helpful to people who are like not librarians to maybe add some categories besides fiction and nonfiction, like so that's clear where to look? It would be probably, but it would also be expensive and mean relearning for a lot of librarians. Not to mention the fact that there are now uh, online um, catalogs such as WorldCat that. Oh, I'm sorry. She wanted to know if it might be more helpful for our customers. And by the way, we're not allowed, we're discouraged from calling our customers patrons. We're, we're supposed to call them customers. So it would be more um, helpful for customers to have more than the two split. But remember that it's not a monolithic split. split. Uh, under the nonfiction, there are 20 um, categories. Um, no, 21, 21. Uh, and then all of those are split. It's more like a tree of knowledge. Uh, how standardized is this? Like, does the University of Maryland libraries comply with other university libraries? Most libraries let the Library of Congress or other librarians um, classify the books and do copy cataloging, it's called mainly because original cataloging is quite expensive. Um, therefore, yes, there's a lot of uniformity. There didn't used to be. My library, for example, until the mid-1960s had its own classification system, which was even weirder than the Library of Congress, because we still find the books, and um, switched over to the Library of Congress then because they had started a service of sending out catalog cards for everyone. Yes. Oh, this is great. This is wonderful. This is. Um, ha has there been like a serious decline in library use in like since it's been so like recently it's been so much easier to just use the internet? That is actually a very interesting question, and the answer is, of course, yes and no. Um, we are much online. If you go online, uh, for example, at my library site. Uh, which I'm not going to say here because, as I say, I'm not representing them today. Um, 
you will find all sorts of really good information. Uh, and we do count that as use. You know, we, we go to Google Analytics and it lets us know how we're being used. Um, we use online sources. But um, for walk-in use of the library has actually increased. Some circulation has declined as people access more online. But remember, librarians are the gatekeepers. We know where all this stuff is coming from. And we have ways to uh, evaluate websites to make sure that you're getting the best information. So by telephone, by email, we have a chat service. Most libraries do have all these things. We're very accessible. You don't have to be a walk-in into the brick and mortars. But do, anyhow. Did, did that answer your question? I have to tell you something funny. Um, for a while in the library world, in, in the 80s, um, the, there was this big movement of the follow-up question, making sure you had completely answered everybody's question. So we were trained ridiculously for a while to an, end every transaction by saying, and does this completely answer your question? And this has become a catchphrase among librarians. You'll hear them say it to each other and giggle. <laughs> now you know. Yes? Um, I used to work in a, in a library when I was an undergraduate student. Um, and you mentioned that you're being discouraged to um, call people who come to the library patients. We were encouraged to do that. So why might that be a difference? Um, it's more, it's the bookstore uh, philosophy of the library of making sure we treat them like customers and not like uh, they felt there, there was sort of a condescension or some sort of wall built if we called people patrons customers it makes us more friendly yes you said you had your own number did you write a book oh you didn't catch that um, it, it, Underneath the book I used as an example, it said in little letters, she wrote this book. <laughs> Here, let me, let me, can I back up? 157,000 songs. If you ever need to know where to find a song, I'm your person. I've been looking for this book all my life. <laughs> University of Maryland has it. Yes, one more. Um, Ebooks. Yes. How do you guys uh, handle that. I know, like when a book is published in print, the Library of Congress gets a copy, and then they can catalog it. What about ebooks and all the? You can publish on Amazon now and all that stuff. How, how does that work? And how does that impact you guys? Um, it actually impacts us very positively. We lend mm -hmm. Nooks and Kindles, and uh, the customer can load it with twenty books. Uh, so we get 20 statistics out of it. And, and bear in mind, libraries live and die by statistics. The more you use us, the more the government is inclined to support us. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's just like any other book. You can borrow the Nook for three weeks. With, you know, this, students find this useful because they can have all the books they need in one place. Uh, of course, not everything you need is, is Kindleized, as I like to say yet. But, but we're heading in that direction. Um, we are planning on a download center. We got a grant. Um, so I, you know, when and where and who and how, I don't know. What about um, self-publishing? Like, people can self-publish online as ebooks and things like that. We, we tend to shy away from self-publishing, um, mainly because if we did do that, we'd be inundated. Um, we have poets, I, I now work in the department that also has poetry, and every day some poet comes in waving his, you know, print out, you know, here I wrote a book, you know, can you have it in the library? And the answer is no, we can't, because if we did, we wouldn't have any room for everything else. If they go through a publisher and, um, you know, have an agent and so forth, we're much more inclined to buy. Do you foresee that changing? When I started out 35 years ago, we had a book catalog and we thought microfiche was the great technological advance. So I am not going to bother to predict anything. 